All right. Right on schedule. Had everything ready before I came in today so I could give him his extra time he asked for. So, um, today I'm going to discuss the concept of views. And I'm also going to have a quick discussion about the finals. Um, I'm actually giving you guys the down the road side of this. Uh, next week, we're covering the last topics. And if I go through it fast enough, I'll even do the quote unquote review next week. And that means that the last class is actually not a class, which might be good for you guys because it's literally, you know, an extra hour that you have for whatever you need. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, but it is what it is. All right. So the topic of the day is views. Um, now, having taught level two of this database course, like this, I've taught the second course after this. Um, it's funny because they cover views in that class too. Uh, um, and strangely enough, this class actually covered views in more detail than the other class did, strangely enough. Um, now that I know what's in both, I am going to give you guys what you actually need versus the, uh, I went through the slides this morning and they were insanely detailed. Um, they were more detailed than stuff I took when I went through school, when I had, you know, tons of time to learn this, these topics. So what is a view? A view is a object in the database that represents a query. My database prof in college would be really upset to hear me explain it like I'm about to, because he really liked the technical answers to this. A view is like a bookmark in your web browser. You give a bookmark a nice short name that could go to a big long URL, and then you can just use that short name to get to it. Views, you have a nice big fat query, and you give it a nice little name, and magically, you can refer to that big fat query with a short little name. No, it's not a bookmark, but it's the easiest way to explain the general concept to people that have been living with web browsers pretty much their entire life. Um, now, there's a few different, in MariaDB specifically, and MySQL kind of, um, there's a little extra to the views that some of the other database servers don't have because the other database servers are smart enough that they don't need to go the extra mile to make it configurable. There is configurability, but it's not the way it is in MySQL and MariaDB. Um, I'm talking about it here because I stripped most of this out of the slides, but I might not have cleaned up the slides completely. So there might you might see a spot where it talks about an algorithm. So I figured I'd bring it up front here. When you create a view in MySQL or MariaDB, you can define what algorithm it uses. And there's three. There's the temp table approach, which once I create a view, you'll understand where that's coming from. Temp table is the most flexible. It's also the slowest. Merge is the most common way that views run. And then it has one called undefined. Here's a pro tip. Undefined is the default mode. And why is it the default mode? Is because MySQL figures out the best way to run the view on its own, so you don't need to figure it out ahead of time. Uh, merge has a lot of limitations that temp table does not have, but for most views, merge is adequate. Um, in on a merge view, there is no performance hit. So um, when you create views, there's no performance issues. If you just leave it as undefined, Realistically, even if you use a temp, the temp table approach, I honestly, the performance hit is microscopic. So it really doesn't make a difference. So I'm going to dive into creating a basic view for you guys. So this is going to harken back to lecture two. Remember yield create command? You know, create table. Yeah, but this time it's uh, create view. 
and I'm going to give it some nice name. Um, since I'm going to play with, hang on, it's like database. There we go. Um, I'm going to give it a name, call it Airport Countries. And I'm going to write myself a query. I'm going to go select name, no, hang on, airports.name, comma, countries.name, as a country, and as airport. Sure. From airports, join. Uh, countries on like that. So before I create my view, I'm going to run my query, make sure it works. It's working. We have an airport. We've got a country. If we scroll long enough, we'll get out of um, there. There's Cambodia and Costa Rica. Query works as expected. So now I'm going to create a view. You'll notice it just flickered, and you'll see right here that it completed in 13 milliseconds. Now, here's what's nifty. Oh boy, it's gonna be one of those days. Yeah, I'm missing an M. I've been feeling very keyboard challenged today. I'm going to run this one, and here it is again, same result. However, which one's shorter, this or this? Obviously, the second one. Now, here's a few little things you need to know about views. A view will run the underlying query. It will um, use any indexes that exist in the existing tables. It looks like a table, it smells like a table, but it's not a table. It will behave pretty much like a table, which is cool. You can use it in pretty much anywhere where you'd have a table. You can use it in joins, you can use it everywhere else. However, there's a limitations to what the views can do. For example, this view is not updatable. In other words, I cannot update the data inside that view. There's very specific criteria to make a view updatable, and you'll learn those in level two. Because <laughs> there's a whole like 10 minute conversation about that in level two. But for all intents and purposes, making a view be updatable or allowing you to delete, insert, or change the data inside the view is a big pain in the ass. It is not straightforward, and all the limitations that it requires basically defeats the point of having a view. Views are usually used for a few different things. You can use it to abstract the table structure. So let's just say you have application developers, and you don't want them to actually know what the entire database structure looks like. You can give them views. You can use views to hide columns from the developers. Uh, let's say you got sensitive data in the database and you have two ways of accessing the data for the database, the application that runs on the internal network and a website. You may set up all the pages on the website to use views that exclude any sensitive pieces of information. That way, even if they compromise the site and they get to look at the source code or whatever, they still don't know what the database structure looks like because they're getting a, it's coming from a view. Cool beans. Um, you can use views to restrict permissions. You'll learn a little bit about that in level two also. Um, that is essentially the purpose of a view is to help you abstract the database. You can make a big table smaller. Uh, you can make complex queries easier to manage. Uh, maybe it's a query you need to run on a regular basis. For example, we just created one at work uh, last week to um, amalgamate disk space usage from one of our services into a weekly summary by client. So instead of having to write a really complex query that runs every week, we just go select star from the view and bam, there it is. 
And that way, when he, when it's connected to an external service, because we got an external service with Power BI, if it's a reporting dashboard system, can I just ask for that view without it needing to know the underlying structure of the database or the data inside of it? It just says, hey, can you give me the summarized data for last week? And it goes, yeah. Um, so that's one of the big purposes of a view is to help you abstract stuff to make things simpler to work with um, or to hide things or whatever. Now, one of the other uh, things you need to know about is when, let's say I want to change the structure of the view, okay? Um, I'm going to just grab my command right here. And I forgot to include this, uh, change the view. They have a command called replace, create or replace. So create or replace says, hey, create this if it doesn't exist, otherwise replace it with whatever I'm giving you. So, and I'm gonna go airports.id, comma, and I'm going to run this. And it just flickered. So now if I were to grab that one again. Now here's our ID. So the good news is in modern MySQL, MariaDB, and most other database servers, um, you can actually do a replace view and add columns to it. There once was a time, and actually I think Postgres is still like this. I don't know if Oracle is still like this where if you were adding a column or taking a column away from the view, you couldn't replace it. You had to drop it and recreate it. It was just the way it was designed because they did it for performance reasons so that it didn't need to rethink about what the query is actually doing. Uh, the good news is now that most modern databases have the create or replace will actually replace it with no matter what you do to the underlying query. As long as you don't completely change it, it's probably fine. So if you need to add stuff, that's cool. Now to show you that, yes, um, it works like it's supposed to. Star from, no, actually let's go select uh, root ID. No, let's go roots.id comma um, airport entries dot uh, airport. from uh, port countries going routes on start. Uh, so port ID is equal to Well, it's just going to be ID. There. And now we've got ourselves with the root ID and a source airport. As, it, as you can see, I'm using it in the from clause. It's perfectly happy. Like I said, it looks like a table. It smells like a table. It's not a table. Can anybody guess what the difference is why it's not a table? You'll learn this a lot more in detail in level two, but why is this not a table? Once, not quite. That's, you can make a view be updatable or deletable, but the, you just have to do certain things to it. It's because it doesn't contain data on its own. It's dynamic, well, at least, views in MySQL MariaDB or what's called dynamic views. In other words, every single time you call the view, it runs the underlying query every single time. So it's live. It doesn't store the data. It goes, hey, we want to do this. So let's go and, you know, pull the data right away and basically stores it in memory as a temporary table kind of thing. And then it runs from there. Now, What's really cool, and you'll learn about this in level two, but I'll give you guys a preview. What the interpreter is actually doing is it's reading the, the instructions for this 
query, which is a little bit new with this up here. And then it figures out how to merge in this join to it. So it actually rewrites the view on the fly so that it, the, the extra criteria you're feeding it, it's able to figure it out on its own, which is really nifty. Um, and, you know, I can go airport, oops, where airport countries, countries dot uh, country is equal to Canada. But it looks just like a normal table. You can also use it in a um, subquery if you want. So if I were to go select um, Actually, let's just redo this one right here. Um, select roots ID. What was the point of even copying it? I'm rewriting the whole thing. Roots, uh, where, where destination airport ID in, select ID from airport countries, where uh, country, is equal to France. And you can use it in the subquery too. Um, not exactly the most useful kind of query I've created up here for you guys, but one of the things that's great for doing this like this is that you don't need to know about the join to figure out the country because you're already, you know, creating that on the fly as it goes. Um, you can, there are limitations in when you use the views, especially in a subquery. Um, usually it's if you create a view with an aggregate, things get a little weird. So I'm gonna create a new view. I'm gonna go uh, create, let's figure out my query first. Count of star as airports. Uh, countries dot name why well, type again if you don't have to uh, countries dot name country I'm gonna run this make sure my query is good it's good so I'm gonna create uh, actually let's go uh country so good to do it the right way let's include it there nothing's changed excellent so now i'm going to go create view country let's go uh country airport count as I've just created myself my happy little view so I can again and it's working now this was in the slides we're going to find out if the slides are lying or not or how old these slides are uh, from uh airlines join country airport count country id um where country name is equal to canada uh, that's because i called it Entry. The slides lie. So the lie, the slides say that if you have an aggregate in your um, view, you can't use it in a join. It's lying. So good. That was one of the things it's about because something I've done for years in a different database engine. And I was really curious if MySQL had this limitation. So as you can see, there's very few limitations which you can do with the view other than making it updatable. 
Um, and in case you're a uh, future prof, because I'm, apparently I'm not teaching level two course next semester, doesn't cover the views properly, to make it updatable, you have to include every mandatory field plus the primary keys. So if any fields are set as not null, they must be part of the view. The primary keys and the foreign keys must also be part of the view. At this point, why not return the entire table? Because you're defeating the whole point of abstracting the table. Um, oh, there was one other um, use for a view that I forgot to mention when I was talking about why would you want to use a view? When you are doing a lot of application development, sometimes the database structure needs to change. The problem is that you may have lots of applications out in the wild expecting the database structure to look a certain way, and then you have to change it. For example, at one point, password fields were really small because they were using either no encryption or using really crappy hashes. And they only needed like the ability to store something like 24 characters. And then suddenly, you know, the rainbow tables came out and cracking a password that is in a rainbow table is a matter of milliseconds. Um, because if you have the rainbow tables and you knew, and you know what hashing algorithm they're using, you can just literally do select star from table where the hash might equals to this. And it gives you a password that will work for that person. It might not be the real password. It's a password that will work for that person. MD5 is the exact algorithm I'm referring to. Suddenly they realized that was a really bad idea. So they changed it to SHA1. Then they changed it to SHA256. 256 needs 256 characters to store the password. So suddenly you need to replace the password field and you don't want to break the existing applications, you would actually make the changes and then create a view and rename the underlying, you'd rename the underlying table, create a view with the same name, but remap which field is actually the password field. And that way you can change the database structure without breaking ex uh, legacy applications until the updated version gets pushed out. So you can use it to like shim is the right word. Um, changes to the back end without breaking the front end. Um, I know it's to understand the back end front end thing might be a little rough at level one, but the back end does some shit, the front end does some different shit. And when they, they're not expecting the same thing, like one says, I got this, the other says, oh, I'm expecting this, everything goes bad. So you can actually um, basically go to the front end and say, this is the field you want. You know, do the good old Med Jedi mind trick to the front end because the back end changed. Um, all right, so that's the basics of a view. The slides have a lot more detail than this, but this is what's important to know. You can create these views, you can use them in joins. Apparently you can use aggregates in them and it doesn't care. Um, it is probably using some special algorithm for each of these. Um, so if I go look at my flight DB and I look at my views, um, when I go SQL script, um, generate this to here. See, even this thing is not even changing the algorithm because it, there's no point changing the algorithm. Um, yeah, nobody changes the algorithm. Just use the default algorithm, which is undefined. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about, yeah, 724. That gives me exactly 20 minutes to talk about the next thing, which is your final evaluations. Yay. Um, final exam has been printed. I haven't picked them up yet, but they're at the print shop. Okay. It's Scantron. You guys already experienced Scantron with your JavaScript prof. You know the blue sheets of the bubbles? Yeah. All right, it's 35 questions, 90 minutes. I'm going to post all this information. You don't need to take a picture. Every semester I see students go, well, I'm going to take a picture of this. Don't worry, I'm going to actually put it in the announcements. Okay, it's 35 questions, 90 minutes, no aids. Okay, it's multiple guess, also known as multiple choice. 
Every question has one answer. It's not the pick the top two or kind of, it's none of that crap. There's one answer per question. It's going to cover, yeah. If you're doing the labs, the exam will be straightforward. I'm not skipping any theory in the lectures. I'm just covering it without going through 26 slides plus not doing demos. So you either get demos that shows you how it works or you get slides. I just read the slides to you. Or you can read the slide yourself, right? When you get the demonstration. So yes, it's going to be based on the content of the slides. Read the slides. That's your study guide. Do the labs. It'll make sure you actually understand when I'm going to go over a little bit of this in a moment. So let me get back to this and I'll explain a bit more. So it's going to cover the select statement because there's no way I can ask you questions about the second half of the term without involving select and where. Like, honestly, like you can't do the second half unless you know some of the first half. So there's going to be some questions from the first half in there, but realistically, you should know what these things are by now. If you've been doing the labs yourself and not asking uh, Bing, Chat GPT, or your friend to do the work for you, it'll cover pretty much views, subqueries, and joins. Will be a pretty big focus of it. Um, there's going to be a few questions about functions, which I'll be talking about next week. Um, next week, I'm actually going to give you a breakdown of topics, as in you're going to have five questions of this kind, three questions of that kind kind of thing, so that you have a better idea what to pay attention to. It's fairly straightforward, I think. Um, there's going to be a f uh, uh, several questions of the nature of, I show you a query, and it asks you, based on this query, pick the right answers to what's going to happen. So that means you have to understand what the query is going to do, which means you if you did the lab, questions will not be. Okay. There's nothing specific to MySQL. It's all the generic SQL stuff. So like statement is this. Uh, this is a join. That's a left join, a right join, whatever. What's the behavior? Um, creating a view, that kind of thing. All right. So that's the basics of it, of what's going to be on there. Um, like I said, no aids. So when you come in, laptop goes and stays in your bag. Honestly, if you have a locker, leave your bag in your locker. It'll be easier than a big pile of bags at the front of the room. Because I'm not keeping an eye on your shit. Right? Because I'm keeping an eye on people over here, wherever room we're in. H102. So we're, while we're smelling the pastries and the steaks. I won't be paying, I'll be paying attention to the food and you guys and not the bags. Uh, realistically, I might just let you guys keep the bag under your desk, but there will be no electronic devices. So that means your phones go away. Your smartwatches go away. Headphones are not going to be on. Unfortunately, don't get to listen to music while you take the test. I've had people ask that. Uh, the only way you get to have that is if you get permission to be in Cal, because there are exemptions to let you listen to music in Cal. Um, but you know, but they give you an MP3 player with a playlist on it. You can tell, give them a playlist and they'll build you a playlist, but they'll preload it so that it's only their device with their headphones. So, you know, all right. So Scantron, bring a good HP pencil. If you do your Scantron test with ink, it's not going to scan. If I, if I, because I'm going to be checking them when you hand them in. If I notice that there's ink, I'm going to get your... If you didn't bring a pencil, that's TFB. Not my problem. Take a guess what the F stands for. Do something bad. Okay? It's your responsibility to show up with a good pencil. Bring a good white eraser. You know, like the, no, the white vinyl erasers? Don't bring the orange ones because it'll rip the paper. Don't use the eraser on the pencil because it'll rip the paper and wreck it. And you'll have to redo it. So bring the white eraser. 
it does a better job cleaning it up. Um, yes, you can bring something to drink. Preferably you bring a transparent bottle. Why? Because I've had cases where somebody had a nice big mug like that, they were taking the top off and they were drinking and they had actually stuck answers on the inside of their thing. No, really, I've been doing this for 18 years. If there's a way to cheat, I have seen it. So yes, you can bring water. You can bring a coffee if you want. You're gonna take the lid off your coffee so I can see inside of it if I decide to take a patrol. Okay, just saying. Please make my life easier. So I don't need to sit there and go, what are you doing? What are you doing? Right? I don't like like leaning over students to see what they're doing because it makes me feel gross. And it doesn't feel great for you guys either when you got some fat ass going. Okay? So please, yes, you can bring something to drink. Cool. You can bring candy if you want. Yes, within reason. Not in a crinkly bag. If you want to bring something to chew on because, you know, you're nervous and you want to chew on it, put them in a baggie and pick candy that doesn't have wrappers. Take a guess why I don't want to see wrappers. Because I had someone who was really clever and they had five, six kinds of candy and they'd written answers on the inside of the wrappers of each color for different topics. You know, people are really creative with cheating. Just saying. I actually had a, I once had a group of students. So this was when we were having a, uh, this was for a different course where we had like 500 students taking it. We actually had three students doing Morse code-ish on the desk. They were going, question four, answer two. So we'd hear this tapping. We're like, what the, what the freaks? Because at first it just sounded like someone was nervous, right? Tapping. And after a while we started noticing there was a pattern to it. So yeah, please don't do that either. I know what that looks like. Um, no, you're not allowed to talk to the person next to you. I may not speak your language, but I know what you're doing. Okay? The only thing that's allowed is suddenly bursting out in tears and crying. Because that's pretty hard to fake. Okay? I'm kidding. Please don't cry. Because I really don't know what to do with that. That's, the, that's called depression, Morse code. Um, no, no. Okay. So that's the written test. Um, there, I do have some tips for the, uh, hopefully the camera picks this up. Um, at least hopefully I've got the angle. So you guys have had the experience of the, you know, Scantron, you know, the five bubbles. Here's a tip that a lot of props don't give you because a lot of them don't know. Scantron reads from left to right. Okay. So let's just say at first you decided the answer was A. And then you changed your mind, so you kind of do a shitty erasing job, and then you put something here. Depending on what kind of mood the Scantron machine's in, it'll see this first. And it stops scanning the rest of the line. That's why you got to try to erase it really, really well, or even better, circle it on the exam paper and then fill out the Scantron sheet when you're done, so that you don't need to erase it. Uh, another tip. Okay. This is no good, this is no good, that's no good. Scantron machine is going to look at that and think you just made a mistake. You actually have to fill in the bubble pretty much completely for it to pick up. Okay? Um, the reason why I'm being finicky about this part of this is that I don't scan the Scantron tests. Okay? They get put in an envelope. I walk over to the test center, there's a drop box, and I slide it in the drop box. 24 to 48 hours later, I get an email with people's grades in it. And then email says, oh, by the way, you can go to shipping and receiving to retrieve your test results. That involves me coming back to the school to get the test results, which I am not going to do before I submit my grades. The only time I will do that is when I get a test that comes out looking really, really weird. As in, there's like only three answers or the person got every question wrong, which I have seen because they were off by one. Now they, they skipped one, so suddenly the whole test was off by one. 
right? Because, because the people weren't paying attention. Okay, so you had a question. No, God, no. Yeah, there's 48 of you. Yeah. Yeah, it's just the one test. I mean, if I had like 300 students, then I'd run multiple copies of the test. In H102, there's enough room to put a test with a person, with a space in between each person. So you don't get to sit on top of each other like you do in this room. You're going to be spread out a little bit. If I remember, H102 will hold, almost, uh, hold 80 students. So that should be enough room for me to basically space everybody out. Just saying. Um, test will be down on the thing. You'll sit where there's a test. Sorry if you don't get to sit with your friends. Or you get to sit with your friends, but at a distance. That's life. Uh, you're not there to socialize. You're there to smell bakery and steaks and wine while you take a test. Uh, which again, once a reminder, test at 5.30, so please eat something before you come. Even a granola bar, so you're not hungry. No, really. I kid you not. It's it's horrifyingly bad in there for the smell. Like, because it smells so good most of the time. Um, you know, because the culinary arts students are doing their finals also. Their finals involve cooking things right next door and across the hall. Um, so that whole building smells fantastic this time of year. So that's the exam itself. The practical assessment's basically the same thing as last time. Um, there is a new database for you to load. Um, I've already, you should already be able to see the final practical assessment. That should be visible to you guys. And you guys can't see this, but you guys should be able to see the first few things here. There's the instructions and a zip file. Download the zip file and follow the instructions, which is download, unzip, Launch data grip, right click and run SQL script. Sounds like lab one, because it's the exact same steps. And it says locate the first script. So I got to fix that, because there used to be three scripts and I fixed it so it's only one. So locate the script. Um, the restore will take a while. The original version of this took on this machine, which is pretty baller. Um, almost 15 minutes. After I cleaned it up, it ran in two. This is an i9 or an Ultra 9 with 32 gigs of RAM and a Gen 5 NVMe. Those of you with old beater laptops, do not expect to do it done in two minutes. There's like half a million rows in this database. I'm giving it to you ahead of time so you have a chance to explore it. Look at the tables, look at the data, figure out how you would do the joins. Maybe figure out how you'd create some views or what the aggregates would be. Uh, this practical assessment will be using this new database, the world database, and potentially the employees database, depending which group you're in. It uses a combination of different databases. You'll actually be switching databases between questions. It's basically making sure you actually understand basically the whole concept of everything you learned this semester. Um, the three sections have pretty much the same test with, you know, say the variations, obviously. Um, it'll be the same thing as last time. You're going to submit an SQL file to me. And then I'll grade it. It will be during your normal lab period. You will have an hour, 50 minutes, one hour, one, one colon colon five zero, right? Not one and a half, one hour and 50 minutes to do the test because, you know, that last 10 minutes you're supposed to run to your next class anyways. Um, eh? Well, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, you're on your computer. Just please don't use one of the chat GPT or Bing. Although... Pretty sure that ChatGPT and Bing probably don't know about the Algonquify database. So it will probably wouldn't help you too much. World database it knows about, the employees database it knows about because those are standard databases that are used everywhere for teaching. Algonquify is the first time I've seen it. Um, it's a chunker. 
Um, the backup is uh, 17 megabytes, 18 megabytes. Uh, and that's after I optimized it. The original one was closer to 85. Um, it was just really stupid the way we set up. So do this prep before the midterm, before your final assessment, because you don't want to lose three to 15 minutes of your SBA time to something you should have been able to do to prep ahead of time to make sure everything is working. Once again, if you are having technical difficulties before the test, please email so we can move you down a little bit um, because it happens. So make sure data grip is working right. Make sure um, the databases are, are, are there and MyriaDB is launching like it should. Make sure everything is working like it should before you come to that class. So I don't need to spend 10 minutes at the start of a class trying to help someone get their copy of data grip working because they didn't follow the instructions and activate it. Two students, that problem. Um, okay, so your SBA will be in the last week of December. Um, we can look at the calendar, not the last week of December, last week of class, which is going to be uh, here, third, fourth, and fifth. Your final exam is here. It's on the 10th at 5.30, 1735, for those of you that like to do non-North American style time, 1730. Um, one hour, 50 minutes, an hour and a half for this one. Outside of that, um, that's the deets. Uh, next week, I'll give you a better breakdown of what's on the theory exam. And I will confirm exactly how many tasks you have for the SBA. Um, I am going to cover um, just some basic functions next week. Um, and week after, like I said, after next week, I don't have any new content to cover. I might cover that odd topic that one of the other profs decided was a good topic to have that I'm not evaluating you guys on so that, you know, if anybody wants to come and actually learn about something called common table expressions, you can come here and I'll give you a quick, quick and dirty demo of what those are, but it's not on a test. It's not being evaluated. So you come if you feel like learning and if nobody shows up, fantastic, I get to go home early. Um, all right, any questions about the stuff I just finished talking about? No? Okay. Going once, twice. Okay, you were done. Oh, of course, there's a hand that went up, okay, two and a half. And you're gonna have to speak up because I know you, sp you speak really quietly. Or you can use whatever you have on your computer, just not chat GPT or an AI tool or um, WhatsApp or um, Telegram or Facebook Messenger or Discord or Slack. You can use any existing reference material you have. You're just not allowed to ask someone else. And by someone, I'm also including AI in that for answers. Okay? All right. Okay, that time I'm done.